Well, thank you very we much, Dr. Welcome, Dr. David Maas. We are indeed very fortunate to have the president of ISPAD with us at the best of ISPAD for the first time in India. So once again, a heartwarming welcome to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar and, and Dr. Chala. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, that, yes. That, that's fine, yeah. Okay, very good. So uh, thank you again uh, very much for this kind invitation and uh, wonderful conference. I've, I've enjoyed the talks so far. Um, so just a uh, for me, a personal memory of being in, in Hyderabad in 2018 and uh, with other editors uh, of the 2018 guidelines, uh, the late Carlo Acerini and then Maria Craig, who uh, is the editor-in-chief for this year's 2022 guidelines, which will be out in full soon, and then Dr. Ethel Kottner as well. So uh, very fond memories of a wonderful visit to, to Hyderabad in 2018. And then also we had a very nice conference in uh, Abu Dhabi, and uh, congratulations to Dr. Asma Deeb and her team who uh, organized and you'll see many uh, familiar faces in, in this uh, picture at the networking dinner. And also uh, just a uh, call out, uh, I had the, the privilege of uh, attending the APEG conference um, in their science school and uh, really had a wonderful time just to highlight our international connections and how wonderful it is to be able to get together both virtually and, and in person. So I will give just a little bit of, of data on uh, how we're doing with hemoglobin A1Cs with a little bit of a U.S. focus, but also the sweet data. I believe Dr. Thomas Danny is uh, part of the program as well, and he will talk about the sweet registry. Then I'll focus a little bit on disparities to, to access and diabetes technology and, uh, again, focus a little bit on the U.S. story and, and talk about <clears throat> how our fragmented healthcare system um, ha has led to this and the consequences, and then some of the programs local and, and nationally that we've tried to design to uh, improve this. So these are data that you've probably seen before. These are from the type 1 diabetes exchange. They were published in 2016 and 18. And you'll see in the figure over here on the uh, right side of the screen that we've got the data uh, for A1C across the lifespan in orange, that those were the data from 2010 to 12. And unfortunately, things got worse um, in that blue line between uh, 2016 and 18, um, approximately six years later. So we were very uh, disconcerted about this. We looked a little bit more and we saw that if you look at the under 13, the 13 to 26 or over 26, that with increasing technology, uh, be it going from uh, blood glucose monitoring to CGM or going from MDI to pump and then combinations that you had the better outcomes. So that was a little bit of a, a clue for us, perhaps in what we might be able to do. But to jump now to, to the SWEET uh, registry, and this is a international registry, and you'll see very good representation here in India, um, a few centers also in North and South America, Australia, Africa, and then, and then many in Europe. And so this is just a, a recent paper that came out showing the importance of uh, and the value of being part of a registry such as SWEET with the benchmarking. And you can see that across the lifespan from 0 to 18 in 2008 to 10, and then versus 2016 to 18, that there was a, a decrease across the pediatric age group. And then looked at another way, if you compare the data from 2016, 18 to 2008, 10, all but one clinic had an improvement in their A1C over time, uh, just supporting the fact that having this attention to uh, clinic data um, and outcomes and then benchmarking that to other uh, clinics can, can really uh, lead to improvement as well as learning from each other. So I'm going to talk just a little about diabetes technology and disparities. And again, jumping back to the T1D exchange, how do we explain that increase in A1C? And in this paper by Kelly Miller, um, looked at what's the role of diabetes technology, income, insurance, and race ethnicity. And to <clears throat> cut to the, to the findings, there were many figures such as this, again, showing those curves of A1C across the lifespan. But in people who had uh, public insurance, uh, lower income, Hispanic or Black versus non-Hispanic white, those who did not have CGM, those who used MDI versus pump, they all had higher A1Cs. So this led us to a, another comparison then, um, Dr. Ananta Adela um, and Maria Wazano with the DPV um, group um, and Reinhard Hull, that we made a comparison on what were the outcomes in the T1D exchange compared to DPV. 
um, comparing CGM, pump use, and hemoglobin A1C. And to cut to the chase here, because this is a complicated slide, um, to just say that um, there was a greater gap in the U.S. versus Germany when you looked at these outcomes by socioeconomic quintile, when you compared the lowest to the highest, that difference in the US was 39% in pump use versus 6% in pump use in DPV. So not that much of a difference across uh, whether you're rich or whether you're poor. CGM in the US, it was a 37% difference versus 9%. And then the A1C was 1.3 versus 0.3. Also disconcerting was the fact that this gap was widening for the U.S. Uh, across the decade for, for both CGM and A1C. So definitely saying that there's some work to do uh, for us in the U.S. to try to reduce some of these disparities. This was a nice editorial that came out um, accompanying that paper, um, just highlighting that in care, clinical care as clinicians, we're often focused on uh, the outcomes and the diabetes care, which is very, very important. But we also need to focus on some of these other higher level issues that our patients face and that affect the delivery of care, such as public policy um, and, and structural uh, uh, issues in, and racism, for example, in the United States, uh, social determinants of health, et cetera. And so you might say, well, why is are, are things so complicated uh, in the US? And this is just a, a slide from earlier in this year, looking at all the differences in state Medicaid fee-for-service CGM coverages. So if you have the public insurance in the U.S., um, it, this is a very, very, I, I can't even interpret this slide. It, it's uh, just uh, chaos um, from one state to the next on who gets it and who doesn't get it. And it's uh, very, uh, very frustrating for uh, people with diabetes and also for those of us who are trying our best to provide care. So what are some of the programs that we've come up with and others? Um, one that we've uh, implemented uh, to try to improve uh, diabetes care in rural areas in our state is working with uh, the University of New Mexico as well as the University of Florida to implement this model called uh, ECHO. Um, and what this is, is we try to, um, in contrast to traditional telemedicine, where you would have one person, one provider see one patient, which we've all done much more of in the past, uh, with especially with COVID. But instead, we have um, an education system where it's teleeducation being delivered to primary care physicians in rural areas and raises their level of education around diabetes, and then they're able to reach more patients. Um, we have uh, these uh, weekly sessions that we do uh, in California and also with the University of Florida. And this is a model that's been uh, performed in many different uh, conditions, uh, not only diabetes, but uh, many other conditions as well. This is just an example of where these clinics are. Some of them are five and six hours away from uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. So the idea is that instead of moving the patients into the clinic, you're able to move the knowledge out to the healthcare providers and raise their level of education um, and, and that we learn from each other and that they're able then to um, provide uh, better care locally to the patients that they, they have in their communities. So this is a, a paper from uh, Ashby Walker, who's a medical sociologist who works uh, at the University of Florida team, just pointing out in this diabetes care paper, some of the barriers to technology use and endocrinology care for the underserved communities that we're dealing with in this, uh, in this study. And uh, again, uh, emphasizing that there are society and, and policy as well as community and, and interpersonal as well as the individual um, challenges that are faced out there, the the complexity of of the challenge. And so just to to highlight uh, some of my my colleagues who are working on this, uh, Dr. Mike Haller in, in Florida and Ashby Walker, and then Rehan Lal and, and Anant Adela um, at Stanford, and to thank Helmsley for their funding. So a second program that we've implemented is uh, uh, 4T study or teamwork targets technology. Uh, and tight control in newly diagnosed pediatric patients. And this curve is uh, the data from 2014-16 in our clinic. We're um, looking at months after diagnosis, and you can see that after um, initiating treatment, as we all see in our clinics, the A1C comes down, but then started drifting up here at the four to six month period. And so our idea was, are, can we come up with a program to try to flatten this curve once it gets lower and to try to uh, prevent that increase? So we came up with three aims, um, including implementing a, a changed uh, education program, but also then uh, 
recognizing that diabetes care is more than just a hemoglobin A1C or glucose um, values, but also the patient reported outcomes are very important. So we are working with our psychology team to implement that. And also then um, working with our engineering team to try to develop an uh, automated system to identify the need for insulin doses between those quarterly visits that, that we typically have done. And this uh, data on the baseline uh, historic cohort was published in DTT by uh, Dr. Prahalad in 2019. So this is um, a slide from um, a paper by uh, one of our engineering colleagues, Dr. Shanker in the New England Journal Catalyst. And this is just a, a schematic uh, that shows what we often see in our patients after they get diagnosed and um, that their glucose will start to drift a little bit higher than they may come in and have a, a visit and it might get better for a little bit, but then it starts drifting again. Uh, they have another visit, then it starts drifting again after some improvement and pretty soon you're out of uh, the range that you'd like to be in as far as control. So the idea with this uh, program is, um, can we, and I'm having trouble getting my slides to advance here. Um, thank you. There we go. Um, and in this slide, um, the idea is, is there a way for us to uh, have remote monitoring via these continuous glucose monitors and be able to then intervene when we see that the glucose values, I mean, glucose is going up, that we can have an intervention uh, remotely instead of uh, waiting for every three months so that we're able to keep them then in target. Um, and so, uh, one idea with that is if we're using these continuous glucose monitors to have a system where we get that data into our electronic medical records or into a dashboard and our diabetes educators are able to see that information um, and understand what's going on and, and be able to contact families uh, when they need that help and lead then to a lower hemoglobin A1C, more time and range, better quality of life, and, and less hypoglycemia. And so Dr. Prahalad published uh, the first paper, the pilot study on this, and found that we got a reduction of about 0.58% uh, at one year. Also, there were... Uh, a handful of those patients, uh, 89 of the 135 who had um, the remote monitoring as that system was being built and they had an even better outcome um, than those who didn't get remote monitoring. So just want to thank um, a big team of people who uh, worked on that locally um, and also some international colleagues. Um, also want to point out just in the last uh, minute or two here is this paper that was from um, the two years, the odds of having an A1C less than 7% increased by two and a half times and of being above 9% decreased three times, their odds of DKA reduced by, by, uh, by two. And also they showed that real-time CGM was cost-effective. And so that's a very important point as well. And then just to, to remind everyone um, that automated insulin delivery, we heard a very nice talk from Dr. Wadwa um, is now A-level evidence from the uh, ADA standards of care. We also have the um, ISPAD guidelines that will be coming out, which also uh, state that as well. So this is a paper on open source automated insulin delivery that came out, a consensus statement that was also endorsed by ISPAD. And um, to remember that in the ADA guidelines, um, we have uh, uh, mention of... Uh, do-it-yourself systems um, as uh, E-level evidence and that um, providers cannot prescribe these systems, but should assist in diabetes management to ensure patient safety. And then this is a paper that just came out in the last couple of months from the New Zealand group, um, Dr. Burnside and Dr. DeBach and colleagues, um, and just showing very similar uh, improvement in glucose uh, values to percent time and range in this slide um, across the whole uh, day. Of course, the more marked improvement uh, overnight, but still continued improvement across the day. So in summary, um, ADA and ISPAD both uh, state that the standards of care for CGM um, that encourage that and CGM use has increased, but all people with diabetes should have access to diabetes technology. And after CGM, next is access to automated insulin delivery for all, but let's not forget that access to insulin, um, access to care remains a global problem, and we should push for the best care possible for all people with diabetes. 
So just want to thank uh, everyone in, within the conference for the opportunity to present and also remind people that the um, ISPAD conference will be in Rotterdam in 2023 and to save the date. And thank you.